This video is sponsored by RenderHope. Stick around to see how you can get high quality 3D models and also how you can join an amazing community of 3D creators. Hey, what's up guys and welcome back to Ask NK. So, as the year progresses, let's go ahead and talk about some pretty cool stuff that possibly will be coming to Blender 5.0. And of course, a couple of things that I believe a lot of you guys possibly missed. As this set of features and possibly announcements might change how we get to work with Blender forever. One of the first things that I have to talk about is the brand new tease of NVIDIA DLSS, which is the deep learning super sampling tool from the folks at NVIDIA, as this seems to be coming to Blender 5.0. This was teased during SIGGRAPH and it looks pretty amazing. And for those who have no idea what NVIDIA DLSS actually is, this is one of the first AI based upscaling systems to reach the graphic card market. And today you can see this in lots of video games and also 3D applications. And most 3D applications that actually have this includes D5 Render, which we're currently making a nice video about. So for those who like to see that, you can simply stay subscribed so you can see that. Then we've got Enscape that also has that. We've got Autodesk V-Red that also has a DLSS. We have Chaos Vintage. So the folks at Unity have implemented that via the HDRP for you know better performance and also real-time rendering. We've got that same feature for Unreal Engine and of course Twin Motion, which is a sister tool from the folks at Epic Games for those who are into architectural visualization. So one cool thing that DLSS actually allows you to do is to get high quality rendering from lower resolutions, as this simply allows compatible GPUs to offer much more better performances by simply rendering lower resolutions and then upscaling them to a higher one. And this technology has existed for some time now for the aforementioned tools and for most games. And when it comes to digital content creation tools like Blender, Maya, 3D Studio Max, Blender seems to be the first out of these ones to implement the DLSS from the folks at Nvidia. And this is going to change a lot of perception about how you get to work with Blender. Because the idea behind this is for you to have the ease of real-time rendering like you have with Eevee. But this is happening with cycles via the DLSS right in your viewport, bringing this upscaling feature into the design process itself. And Jonathan Lampel actually made a post about this one at SeaGraph, which is looking pretty nice. So by default, this is what you get when you're rendering with the typical cycles. And then if you choose to turn on the noiser, if we switch this to DLSS, super nice. You get your renders in real time and this is running in cycles. And Blender Guru also went through to make a video about this, which sort of explains this a little bit more. Look at that. So this is, all right, this is optics. This is what optics looks like. See how slow it is? Look at that. Slow, right? And if you turn off the denoiser, that's what it's doing in the back. The denoise on, right? That's what we have now, optics. And then DLSS, the new one. Look at that. That is incredible. Incredible. And for what it's worth, DLSS is pretty interesting and I'm super excited as this might probably be shipping with Blender 5.0. And this is definitely going to be a huge feature that will change how lots of people approach Blender or even use it, especially for viewport real-time rendering or even rendering overall, as Blender has actually evolved over time from the implementation of EV Cycles, Cycles X, all the way to getting some very interesting new cool updates for Cycles, the whole implementation of Vulkan for the viewport, and now we're getting the LSS and this is looking really good as Blender continues to implement cool features especially to the rendering part of it which makes us sort of forget those times that we have to wait countless minutes or even hours just to get a preview render on the viewport. Another cool improvement coming to Cycles via 5.0 has to do with both subsurfacing and also null scattering but we're gonna focus on volumes because this is looking pretty cool. So for volumes, smoke and fire simulations are now rendered with nano VDB, as this would reduce memory usage at the cost of some performance. And some of you guys may be wondering, what is nano VDB? Well, nano VDB is a GPU optimized lightweight version of open VDB. And this is designed for real-time rendering and simulation. This of course is also developed by the folks at Nvidia. And the idea behind this is to enhance the performance of volumetric data manipulation, making it ideal for motion picture production and other graphical intensive application. Nano VDB by default supports operations like filtering, volume rendering, collision dictation, and ray tracing. All of these can be done while maintaining a small memory footprint, more like what we talked about when we did a video about Zebra VDB. Zebra VDB by default is currently only available for both Houdini and Unreal Engine. And the closest thing to Zebra VDB is Nano VDB, 
and we're getting that with 5.0, which is pretty nice because at this point you will be able to work with VDBs easily inside of Blender. Interestingly, there is also more cool stuff that has to do with that, which includes the null scattering as ray matching has been replaced with null scattering. There's a good number of settings that has to do with how you get to render and how you can control the performance and noise levels when working with the volumes. The blotchy artifacts of overlay volumes are now resolved so you can now make those nice cool explosions and simulations with ease inside of Blender or if you work with DCC apps you can now bring those in and get the best quality out of them in Blender. And this is looking good. All thanks to the partnership and also support from the folks at Nvidia. And speaking about support, the folks at Wacom are now the latest corporate patron to support Blender Foundation. Previously, they were within the corporate gold category alongside Zika, the car company, Meta, Superhive, previously known as Blender Market, Chaos, Adobe, Blender Kit, and Autotrop. And now they've leveled up their donation by simply bypassing the corporate platinum, corporate titanium, and now they are the corporate patrons. And this has also leveled up how much their donation would be. So previously, as corporate gold members, they did contribute about 30,000 euro per year, and now they're contributing about 240,000 euro to Blender Foundation. And the extra 210,000 that has been added to the previously donated 30,000 is roughly enough to pay about three full-time Blender developers which makes a lot of sense. And if you simply go over to the announcement blog post of the expanded partnership, the president and CEO of Wacom actually went on to say, we see a deep shared understanding between Blender and Wacom of the transformative value of creative tools. Our joint responsibility and passion for the creative community drives us to enhance how creators interact with their tools, whether in studios, classrooms or on the go. And Francesco Seed, the CEO at Blender, actually went on to say, our collaboration with Wacom is a major step in making Blender more intuitive on pen and touch devices. It's about bringing the full power of Blender to where artists are, on tablets, on the move and beyond mouse and keyboard. And this partnership includes a couple of things. First off, collaboration with Blender's developer community to ensure seamless integration with Wacom's hardware and software technologies to enhance pen and touch experiences. There's also going to be support for the development of mobile Blender platform, aligning with Blender's roadmap to make 3D accessible on tablets, which will definitely begin with iPad and then expanded to Android. And we already mentioned this in a different video where we talked about Blender coming to iPad. And of course, for those who like to see the video or possibly you like to read upon this, then you can simply go over to the link in the description and check that one out. And finally, for the partnership, this is also going to come with a joint community engagement initiatives, which includes events, showcases, and educational outreach to connect with and inspire the global Blender and Wacom creator communities. And you might be wondering, how is it possible that Wacom wants to donate for the development of Blender for Android? Well, the folks at Wacom, they currently own the Move Ink pad, and this is an Android drawing tablet. And if you take a look at Blender developer's blog post that talks about beyond mouse and keyboard, you'd also notice that Wacom Move Ink Pad 11 is mentioned as one of the devices that they will be building for after they're done building for iPad. And still within the line of Beyond Keyboard and Mouse, Pico has also joined Blender's foundation as corporate patron. You possibly might have spotted that when we talked about Wacom. So Pico is right here. We've got Qualcomm, we've got Epic, and of course, Aras Nesnausk. And for those who are wondering, what is Pico exactly? Well, the folks at Pico are mixed reality and virtual reality device creators, and they would like to join the new campaign of unlocking new productive workflows for artists, which would definitely empower them to pursue their creative visions beyond mouse and keyboard. And this partnership will allow for the enhancement of 3D creation tools and foster a community where artists and developers can bring their unique immersive visions to life and connect with a global audience through OpenXR. And these are very cool stuff to know. Something else you might also notice here is Qualcomm. And why we're mentioning Qualcomm is because Blender for Windows and ARM is something that is here. And this journey actually began sometime with Blender 4.3 and with the support of Vulkan, which is now available for EV via Blender 4.5 things are beginning to look nice. If you simply come over to this blog post, you will see that Qualcomm has actually contributed a lot. It is even written here that with Qualcomm significant support as a patron level member of the Blender development fund, the core development team was able to review and iterate on this project. As a result, Blender can now run on hardware powered by Windows on processors such as the Qualcomm Snapdragon. And just in case you missed the announcement that was made some time ago, here it is. 
It certainly is an exciting time for content creators, and we're going to turbocharge creator apps, starting with 3D modeling. Starting today, Qualcomm is now a member of the Blender Foundation, contributing significant engineering resources to make the most popular free-to-use 3D modeling software better than ever. And this in itself is super cool. And it's safe to say that money alongside development is coming or is already here. And Blender 5.0 alongside future versions of Blender is going to benefit a lot from this. So if you have any of these brand new laptops or even computers with Windows that has Qualcomm Snapdragon as a part of them, you can now run Blender smoothly right there. You can also come through and take a look at the benchmarks and see performance across Vulkan and also OpenGL. And of course, a huge shout out to the folks at Blender alongside Qualcomm, Wacom, Pico, Epic Games and other donors for making this possible. And for Blender 5.0, there's also a couple of cool stuff coming to geometry nodes. And I think these will definitely change how we get to work with geometry nodes moving forward. As the geometry node workshop has rolled out a couple of cool things. Of course, you can come through and read up on some of the nice things that will be coming to future versions of Blender. And one of them has to do with the declarative system, which I think is going to change a lot of things. There's already a blog post about that one. So just in case you would like to read up on the declarative system and see how this would help with declaring several types of fields, data and so on for reusability right inside of geometry nodes then you can come through and check it out and with that said we're getting new socket shapes for blender 5.0 and we already know that blender is currently evolving and the visual language of geometry node is also evolving with it as well to meet up with both the visual language and also future proofing for potential future issues and enhancing workflows within the geometry node and that is why we're getting refined socket shapes and these would help creators and developers know how to differentiate various data types and also how they are represented in a particular node. So previously, what we have are three major shapes, which includes the cycle shape, which basically expects input from a single value and also produces one single value output, mostly for geometries and stuff. Then we've also got the diamond, and this basically contains just field. Now we've also got the diamond with a dot, and this comes in various color variants, and by default, this can be connected to various fields, but currently this socket only holds one single value. And so the idea behind this is for creators to be able to identify what data should be connected to specific nodes. So rather than relying on cues like tooltips, error feedback, or even grayed out sockets to communicate that that data you're trying to work with is pretty incompatible. And this is one of the limitations that creators have had. Now, the solution is to introduce various socket shapes that communicate what data a node expects or generates independent of how it is being used. And with this said, we're now getting about four interesting nodes. The vertical node, which inputs and exports a single value. Then we've got the diamond that inputs and outputs a field. The circle that allows input of different kinds of data or the output that produces different kinds of data depending on the input that was fed in. And this particular node is currently considered as the most flexible. Then we've got the grid slash list shape, and this is currently in development. However, you'll be able to play with this right inside of Blender. Now, if you're thinking about the diamond with a dot, that is currently no longer going to be available. So we're getting new socket shapes with 5.0. Now, this is not the only major thing that we'll be noticing with 5.0, as we're also getting bundles and closures so bundles and closures will be coming to 5.0 and this is going to be a significant upgrade for geometry nodes as the introduction of bundles and closure enables artists to create a more modular powerful and reusable node setup of course all thanks to the declarative system that they are putting in place as bundles would act more like a group data package which can be passed through to various nodes this would help for organized data flow nested structure and robust manipulation so you can connect multiple nodes to this and bundle them with the combined bundle and you can also choose to separate these with the separate bundle as these are the two major nodes that the bundle will be coming with alongside that we also have closures and closures is more of a dynamic encapsulated snippet of logic so this would simply call back functions that can carry context or parameters with them as they will offer more flexibility than traditional node groups because they can simply be passed around which will allow for deeper adjustments within the node tree without rewriting the entire node setup this is going to be very useful for flexible node behavior and better modularity and this would also be coming with its very own nodes. 
which includes the closure zone where data can be injected. And we've also got the evaluate closure. And this would be used to evaluate the closure data that has been done. So there's a very interesting set of read that is currently available right here. So for those who like to read up on this one, possibly if you'd like us to make a full video or a detailed video about this one, you can simply go ahead and put that in the comments. But for what is worth, closures and bundles alongside new sockets and tons of stuff are coming to 5.0. So if you'd like to read up on all of these and see all the cool stuff coming to Geometry Nodes, then links to this is going to be in the description. And outside this, 5.0 would also be coming with some nice cool stuff for the Compositor. And the Compositor is having a couple of new things, as the Displace node now has the interpolation option, and the Compositing node tree is now on its own data block, making it reusable across Blender files. There's also this brand new Split node, which also supports rotation, and we actually talked about that when Blender 4.5 was released. There's a couple other cool stuff which we'll cover in subsequent videos, and for those who are thinking about doing Compositing, Compositor now has a ton of things that I would definitely recommend that you come through and check out. Now, there's also a few places within Blender that is getting some cool stuff. One of them is the rendering. And within the rendering section, the color management has cool stuff that deals with the view transform. There is a new AGX HDR view transform, which is pretty, pretty nice. And we'll also get the ACS 2.0 view transform. And this particular one includes both standard and high dynamic range versions. We also have the new REC 2100 PQ and also the REC 2100 HLG displays. And these can be used for color grading for HDRI video exports. More so, we're getting some cool stuff that deals with both texturing, render passes, baking, and also setting things has also been removed. For the rendering, there's a good number of things coming to that as well. Another place we're getting some cool stuff is animation. So animation seems to be coming with some very cool stuff. We're also going to make a full video about this ones and sort of explain them a little bit more. And for those who are into sculpting, this has a tiny cool update, which has to do with the multi-resolution modifier. This now has the Conform Base as an operation alongside the Apply Base. And this would be really cool for those who are into sculpting. Other than these, things are looking pretty simple, except for the video sequencer, of course, which is getting more and more updates. And this is actually beginning to live up to expectation. Now, one thing which I kind of felt that we might be seeing with animation and rigging is the whole backlover thing. And this isn't coming yet. At least now we're not getting that. Hopefully, this might be in Blender 5.1 or potentially as an experiment with Blender 5.0. And with that said, let's talk about some other cool stuff which I think a lot of you guys might be interested in. For those who are thinking about learning Blender, or possibly you like to get tons of courses that you can work with with Geometry Nodes, then you can simply go ahead and check out the Blender 3D modeling course that is currently available on Humble Bundle. This course deals across a lot of things which also includes Geometry Nodes. So originally, this is going to cost you about £280.51, but you'll be getting this for about £27.9 or even 22.9 for all of these. And of course, the folks at Humble Bundle also have a list of interesting bundles that can come in extremely handy for you, especially if you're thinking about getting started with various tools, or maybe there is a specific kind of skill set that you're trying to get. There are certification courses and also bundles that are now available for an extreme steel right here on Humble Bundle. More so, if you're thinking about learning more stuff for Blender, they might want to consider taking a look at Learning Hub from the folks at RenderHub, sponsors of today's video, as they cover a couple of cool and nice tips and tricks on how you can get started and also resolve certain problems in Blender. This contains tutorials, tips and tricks, and a ton of cool things I believe Blender users would love. More so, RenderHub also has an amazing marketplace, and this marketplace comprises of 3D models, scans, textures, materials, skin, sound effects, and so on. So you can choose to buy or even work with the free assets that this also offers. And of course, if you do have 3D models you like to sell, you can also sell them on RenderHub. More so, RenderHub also has this interesting gallery section. Now, within the gallery section, you'll be able to find inspiring art pieces that you can reference when creating your project. And of course, for those who are thinking about joining a challenge, RenderHub currently has a challenge that you might want to consider being a part of. So this is it for those who would like to take a look at all of this or possibly you like to explore them for yourself, then links to this is going to be in the description. So do well to check them out. Tell me what you guys think about this one in the comment section. And of course, if you like this video or you like something from this, you can go ahead and give a like and don't forget to share with a friend. And until I see you guys in the next one, peace.